Thank you so much for joining us today for the message. As always, I want to encourage you to make sure that you are planted in a local church um, wherever you live so that you are able to serve and worship together with others. But we do pray that our church is a great resource to you and many others. And if our church has been a blessing to you, I would encourage you to join us in financially giving so that we can continue to provide resources just like today's message as well as many other things abroad. Thank you again. God bless. We are in chapter 6, as we talked about last week. I should have told you where to go. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 uh, through 15 this morning, if you're new. For everyone else, you, you know that we've been in this series for quite a while, so you probably knew where to go. Um, I made a mistake. It's good to admit when you make mistakes. Is that true? Yeah, and everybody's like, what do you have to say? What did you do? I made a mistake <laughs> in believing that I could do any form of justice to this text in one sermon. Uh, I knew I couldn't. I don't know why I thought I could. And so what today's message is going to be on the Lord's Prayer is we're going to give kind of an overview and really hitting the points. But then for the next couple of weeks, we're going to break down each of the petitions. There's six, are there six altogether, but three are directed at our relationship with God. Let's, let's get that right first, right? In Jesus's example prayer to us, like make sure before we're talking about the things we need, we remember who he is, right? And then there's three petitions about our needs. God cares about your needs and what you're going through and the things that you feel that you're lacking or are lacking are things that are very important to you. Like, it's so important to know that God cares. God is not bothered by you coming to him on a continual, continual and regular basis. In the middle of the night, at the dead of noon, like it... God loves for his people to come to him with boldness because that has been won by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you come to him, you are recognizing, whether you're saying it that way or not, God, I'm dependent upon you. I'm dependent upon you for the breath that I'm breathing right now, the heartbeat that I'm not even controlling at this moment. I'm depending on you for my daily needs and necessities. Lord, I, I don't want to take anything for granted, right? It's just like, it is good, and as people of God, prayer is communicating with our Heavenly Father who loves us and make it specific, loves you. And some of us, maybe in this season, are going through some really hard things that maybe nobody even knows about. But like God, God does. And God cares. And God has decreed that in such a way that's hard to fully understand when we think about His sovereignty, but has decreed that in such a way that we are to ask because many things, it says in James 2 or James 4, that you don't have because you don't ask. Like, that, that's something we should be bold about. Not demanding, but asking. Asking and what? Seeking and knocking. Anyway, I'm just encouraging you with that. So, I messed up. We're going to just cover the, I want to cover this section because it's good so we can get a good overview, 30,000 feet. And then for the next couple of weeks, I want to break down uh, each of these petitions about our Father who's in heaven and hallowing his name and so forth. When we read the text this morning, we're in chapter 6, verse 5. It says, and when you pray, last week we talked about and when you give. In a couple of weeks, we're going to talk about and when you fast. But and when you pray, you must not look like the hypocrites, or must not be like, I'm sorry, the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And that is the word of the Lord this morning. Don't pray like the hypocrites. But then he adds a tag to it, and don't pray like the Gentiles. Jewish people, they still do to this day, if you're Orthodox Jew, but they would pray at 9, 12, and 3. They had three times in the day, every day that they would pray. 
And then there would also be times in which they would have special feasts and festivals or times of fasting and so forth. And so if it was 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and you happened to be out in the street, you would naturally turn in whatever direction the temple would be at if you weren't already there. Or, you know, Obviously, you're doing daily life and activities and agricultural um, society as a whole. I mean, you would be going. But what he's getting at is like people specifically... Jesus is really getting after the Pharisees and the scribes and religious leaders who they want people to see them. They want people to think highly of them. They want to have respect. They want to be called pious people. And they would automatically turn at 9, say in the morning, 12 or 3. And rather than making it less subtle, it never said that you had to pray out loud. It's not wrong to pray out loud. It's not wrong to pray in silence, neither of the two. But nonetheless, they would make a spectacle of it. It says, don't pray in the street corners and in the synagogues, making sure that everybody knows that, man, listen to his prayer. Listen to her prayer. Wow. They just named every single one of God's names from the Old Testament. They, wow. I mean, they know their Bible. I I was at a um, prayer um, gathering, I guess is what it would be called. And this this gentleman, and I I bet his heart's perfectly pure, so I'm not going to say it's not. But this gentleman, like, had a prayer and the only reason I know it was memorized, and it's not like a prayer from Scripture, it's not a prayer from anywhere else, but it's like, it's like the boom, 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 and I heard him do it before. And I was just like, why? Nothing wrong with memorizing prayer, okay? Nothing wrong with that. But to be very honest with you, especially for those either newer to the faith or those who have more of a liturgical background, a high church background, there's nothing wrong as long as you are contemplating what it is that you're saying. It is wrong that if you're just spitting out words that have no meaning to you whatsoever so that you can say that I recited a prayer, Jesus is saying you're no different than the Gentiles, even if it's good words. No different. But it's just one of those things where it's like we need to be humble as we approach God. God knows your heart. There's no reason to put on a show. There's no reason to put on a facade. You know, it's come to God with this honesty and with this purity. And, and here's the thing, too. Come to God as you are. Not the fake self that you're like, it's just you got through, you know, just yelling at the kids or whatever. And tell God that you're frustrated. He knows you're frustrated. He knows that it's hard. He, know, he knows you're struggling. Like, it's, it's okay. It's, like we ha- it's, it's funny about how we pray. And I mean, all of y'all are thinking about right now how you pray at times. But a lot of times it's like, we'll go into prayer and it's just like, we'll tighten everything up. (sighs) Gracious Father. It's like, yes, but, Lord, I'm struggling. Lord, I need you. Pray. Uh, I I, I love it. Uh, Paul Miller has a book, I think it's called A Praying Life. It's really, really good. It's a great book, I think, to look at. And he does such a phenomenal job on the aspect of really just coming to God as a child, which is what you're supposed to do. And, and, and so anyway, I would just encourage you with just coming to God with all of the baggage. Because he's the one you're supposed to drop it off with. You know, cast your cares unto him for he, what? He, he cares for you, all your anxieties, all, of, all the things that are concerning you and bothering you. He says, don't pray like the hypocrites do because they want to be seen. And, and don't pray like the Gentiles do because they think that if you say enough words, you can twist God's arm. You, you can't force or manipulate God to do anything that is not according to his will. I just, just want to put that out there this morning. You're like, no, if I press God really, no. No, not at all. Like, you, you can't do that. It, I mean, it won't happen. You can try to do that, but it, it just simply won't happen. You know, when you think about people saying repetitive lines and so forth, go all the way back to 1 Kings chapter 18 and the 450 prophets of Baal and and Elijah. 450 prophets against one prophet. And he says, whoever has the real God, whoever's worshiping the real God, fire will come down out of heaven and will burn up the sacrifice. And it says, from morning until noon, they chanted the same chant again and again and again. And then he starts mocking them. He says, well, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's out on a journey. Maybe he's using the restroom. I mean, who knows? He's a god. Who knows, right? And it says that they got even louder and started gashing themselves, and and blood was spewing pretty much everywhere. And finally, it was time for him. And he called upon the name of the Lord, and the Lord sent forth fire from heaven and consumed the entire sacrifice and all the water that he put around it and so forth. But it's just one of those things where, like, if you get into a place, and it's amazing, 
Jesus says the exact words, do not heap on repetitive words again and again. And what do we do a lot of times with the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. And it doesn't mean anything. You memorized it as a kid or maybe as an adult. But it just, it doesn't have any significance to you. And it wasn't as though Jesus said that this is like, you've got to say it exactly like this every single time. It's a model prayer. I called it the Lord's Prayer this morning because that's what we've recognized it for for about 2,000 years. But in reality, it's the disciples' prayer. If you want more of an example of the Lord's Prayer, go to John 17, which is the high priestly prayer of Jesus to his Father on behalf of the disciples. But this really is a disciples' prayer. Like, how are we to approach God? And so what I'd like to do, if you're okay with that, for the next few minutes, I want to break down quickly six points. Because most of y'all know I have trouble with three points, so six points is going to be the feet. But number one is this this morning, if you're taking down notes with me. One, remember to whom you offer your prayers. Remember. Like, remember who you're praying to. When you feel that your problems are so big, I have a good feeling that it's because you didn't first start your prayer with remembering it's our Father who is in heaven. The one who spoke it into existence. The one who created it all. The one who in Hebrews 1 says that he sustains it by the word of his mouth. Like, he sustains everything. It's it's when we begin to feel like everything else is so much bigger because God has become so much smaller that life becomes overwhelming. And it's not to say that you're not going through difficult or overwhelming circumstances, but it's when it's put in its rightful place, things can begin to be seen. A lot of times we start horizontal rather than starting with an upward view, right? Right? Start with our glance towards God. Think about God and his mighty acts and what he's done and who he is. And now think about this. Notice verse 9. Our Father. This is a prayer that's intended to be in a corporate setting. Our. You ever notice that, right? It's our Father. Now this language, we're going to talk about this more next week. But this language is specific to Jesus. And in the Old Testament, Father, referring to God was used only 14 times. In the New Testament, in the four Gospels that we have, right, over 60 times Jesus calls God his Father. I mean, that's incredible, right? 39 books, over two-thirds, more than that, but over two-thirds of the Bible, and it says God is only used 14 times as Father, and all 14 of those times, you ready for it, is referring to being the Father over the nation of Israel, never personally. Come on now, that, that's like worth being like, okay, so what, what are you saying there? You have, as your heavenly father who cares about you, who loves you, who intimately knows every single detail about you, the same one who is God almighty, creator of heaven and earth, who can do anything that he desires to do for he abides in heaven, he's your heavenly father. Man, when you got that, going through your mind he's all powerful but he loves me I'm forgiven by the blood of Jesus the same now think about this Jesus uniquely calls God his father but he has invited you into that story the, the more we understand our adoption into the family of God the more you understand that you are a child no matter where you come from You're like, but man, my family is so messed up. Then that can better point you to the fact that it's not like that. Well, you don't understand, but my father, he was not a good man. Then nothing like that. Even if you had a good father here, an earthly father, we still fail. We still make mistakes. We still have all kinds of shortcomings. But our father in heaven is perfect. Perfect in every single way. And there's not a moment that goes by that he's not aware of you. I mean, that, that's scripture. That's not me adding something to it. That there's not a moment that goes by that he is not aware. So when you go into prayer, when you think about, when you're coming to God, you're like, God, you're my, you're my father. And you love me. Now, this word for father here is Abba, right? That's from the Aramaic. And it, it's really like, this doesn't quite do justice, but it's, it's really like an intimate term when you would say to someone, or to your father, you'd call him daddy. And again, that's a, that's a child's 
intimacy with the Father, whether you're young or old, either way, that's, that's an intimate term. You know, I mess with my mom sometimes, and she gets mad about it. I'm like, mother, <laughs> but I'll say it just like that. And she's like, why do you say it like that? Call me mom. You can maybe say mother, but it's got to be sweet, soft, right? But she knows what I'm doing. I'm messing with her. I know that gets to her a little bit. So I'll be like, mother, I need to talk to you. <laughs> Something like that. But it, think about it. Jesus, Abba, Father. And then we call God Abba, Father. It's, it's such a beautiful thing. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 17, in your worship, God, and on the screen, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. It's following this line that it is a natural thing within you as a born-again follower of Jesus Christ that you, you call out to God and you're like, Father. And some of you might be in a space right now where you're like, man, I feel more like a desert than I do like a lush garden. You know, I really feel like, I mean, there, there are seasons. Please know this. There are seasons in your life as a follower of Jesus that God may feel very far from you. But that doesn't change the reality that he's there. Remember, we got to choose where our feelings get on and get off. Nothing wrong with feelings. But there is something wrong when we allow our feelings to dictate our lifestyle and our actions, right? Because if you begin to feel like God's far from you, then you will be like, well, it doesn't matter. And then if you begin to lie to yourself and say, well, God doesn't care for me, then you begin to see him as a harsh father. You begin to see him as one who's punishing you. You begin to see him as one who's condemning you. And it says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It says that he showed his love for us while you were still an enemy. How much more as a son or daughter brought into the family of God, adopted into the family, does he abundantly pour out his love for you and care for you? Uh, J.I. Packer, he said this. He says, you sum up the whole of the New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy Father, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayer and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. For everything that Christ taught, everything that makes the New Testament new and better than the old, everything that is distinctively Christian as opposed to merely Jewish is summed up in the knowledge of the fatherhood of God. Father is the Christian name for God. Our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. That's good. How do you see God? How do you view God? Are you, are you still in the mode of, I got to earn his love? I've got to earn his favor? I mean, that's, what, that's, this is, that's what's so hard to turn off because in this life, it really is that way. And the closest thing that we have, honestly, in this life is, is actually not the relationship between a, between a husband and a wife, even though it's intended to be that way. It's the love of a parent for a child who's a very small child who can do nothing on their own. And therefore, it's a sacrificial love. It's this pouring in and nurturing love not to receive anything back other than to watch them grow and to flourish. You know, it's, it's an incredible thing when we, when we think about it. And he goes on to say this. He says, he says, our Father is who's in heaven and hallowed be your name. We're going to dive into this more next week. You can't make God's name any holier but... By the way that you live and the things that you think on and meditate on and the words that come forth from your mouth and the actions that come forth from your hands, you're either disdaining the name of God or you're hallowing it. To hallow it, it means to be holy, to be set apart. God's name is holy because God's character is holy. That's who he is. When you look at the attributes of God in Scripture, no other attribute is spoken of. Holy is said three times. Holy, holy, holy. Holy in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Never does it say God is love, love, love. He is love, but it doesn't say it that way. In Isaiah 6, it says God is holy, holy, 
holy. Three times, drive the point. Make sure you get it. Make sure you know it. Make sure you're aware of it. That's who he is. That's his nature. Secondly, I'll move on from there is from the name of God, which represents his character. But now it is, it is God's kingdom that we are to pursue. Number two, it's God's kingdom that we are to pursue. Matthew 6.10, it says, your kingdom come. God's kingdom is universal. Some of you are worried about it. God's kingdom is universal. Psalms 24 and many other places in scripture. God rules over everything, yet there's still sin. There's still futility. There's still brokenness. And so what do we say? Thy kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Now Jesus says what? The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, therefore, right? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So in his ministry, the kingdom of God was invading the world, defeated Satan and death at the cross and then the resurrection, but yet we still long for what? The coming of the kingdom of God in fruition and in full, the consummation of the kingdom, where there's no more wickedness, not in us, not in society, nowhere. It's all done away with. No more curse. No more accursed heat. 109 degree yesterday at 5 p.m. heat index. And for any of you guys or ladies working outside on a regular basis, man, that, that's tough. Doesn't matter where you're at, what fitness level, whatever. Like, it's hard. No more of that which is cursed, for the old is gone and the new has come. Jesus is teaching us to pray that his kingdom come, and we are citizens of his kingdom. Kingdom is a thing that you're going to see again and again and again in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's, it's all about the kingdom of God. It's all about the things of God. Now think about this. If you're a citizen of God's kingdom, what does that mean? Then there's rules that we live by. We're here on earth, but we're citizens of heaven. We don't live like everyone else lives here. We don't talk like everyone else talks here. We don't engage in the same things that everyone else does here. If you feel a bit strange in social settings where you're not around a bunch of other Christians, that's a good thing. I need to say that one more time because some of you are like, I just feel like awkward sometimes, like I'm out of place. That is how it's supposed to be. You feel like I'm a fish out of water sometimes. Like It's true. My dad said he was talking to um, a guide for a hunt that he's trying to schedule in the next year or so, and he put the person on speakerphone, and my mom was in the car. If any of you have ever been on any form of a guided hunt, I'm not saying they all talk like this, but they make sailors blush. Um, it, it's just weird. It's like they don't have any other words or any other adjectives, and so four letters is about as far as they got with the, the, the uh, vernacular when it comes to how many letters in a word. And my mom, after it was over with, because my dad put it on speaker, she was like, you are not going with that person wherever it is that they're going. You will never kill any elk or whatever it is with that person. And it's true. It's like, man, you're just like, we don't. But then you go there and it's normal. It's normal for them. It's no different. It's the same thing in business practices or anything else. You find people and they're like, you don't do that? And you're like, well, no, that's illegal. That's, that's wrong. Well, yeah, but I mean, good gracious alive. What do you mean you don't do that? And you're just like, well, it's, um, <laughs> I'm a Christian. I don't do that. <laughs> and it, it's like, people are baffled by that. And you're just like, but I'm not living for this. I'm not living for this world. I'm living for the one to come, whose builder and maker is God. I'm not living for just the here and now. And, and yes, you will, at times, stick out like a sore thumb. And yes, you will. Or no, you won't be invited to every single gathering because like, people are just like, they're not like us. And not because they don't necessarily like you all that much. They're just like, they don't want to feel any form of condemnation because you're holy. And it's not because you're condemning them. It's just simply because, like, man, they don't talk like me. They don't act like me. They don't do things like I do. And it's really hard to see for a lot of people. Paul Miller says it this way. What do I lose when I have a praying life? Control and independence, what do I gain? Friendship with God, a quiet heart, the living work of God in the hearts of those I love, the ability to roll back the tide of evil. Essentially, I lose my kingdom and I get his. I move from being an independent player to a dependent lover. 
I move from being an orphan to a child of God. And so what do we pray in chapter 6? But seek first the what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And these things shall be added unto you. Some of y'all know as well as I do that as a citizen of heaven, you are going to lose friends and in the process gain new ones. As you grow close to Christ and grow near to his people, it is part of the journey for us. Thirdly here, we talk about now his kingdom. We move on to his will. It is God's will that we are to seek and then to, to do what? To obey. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not our will. You're no longer captain. You're no longer king. And guess what? You can forfeit building all the sand castles that never amount to anything and always get knocked down and never actually sustain anything. You can live for something that is eternal of in ultimate value. And then in the whole process of it, living for God, then your work can be so much more impactful and enjoyable. Relationships can be so much more deep and enjoyable. Moments in time can be thought of in perspective of being in God's kingdom. Like every single thing as a Christian like has so much more depth and so much more meaning. Because no longer is it your show. That it's, it's so vain. It's so futile. And, and at the end of the day, your show is just too small. My show is too small. My thoughts are too small. And yet God has invited you to his to be a part of his kingdom, to do his will. And what does it mean to do his will? It means to obey him. What did Jesus say? My food is to do the will of my father. And who are we to imitate? Jesus. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. We just talked about that. But be tra transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I look forward to getting into this, talking about the will of God. God's very clear about a lot of things, and there's some things, man, you gotta, you got to pray about those things. you got to ask for discernment about those things. But the entire time we're doing what, God, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to say? How would you have me to act? I'm representing you here on earth. Remember Jesus? Matthew 26 in the Garden of Gethsemane. Three times he prays unto the Father. If this cup can pass. But what does he end with? But not my will. Yours be done. You see when we get. To giving us our daily bread, which means meeting our needs, providing for us. We pray in earnest. We believe in earnest. We expect to receive because we believe that we're asking according to his name and according to his will. But even then, at the end of that, we still have, whether we say it in words or have it in our heart, but God, you know better. Your will be done. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now let's flow from here. We made three petitions specifically. Let's get our minds right. Let's think about God. Who is he? Where does he reside? Whose kingdom is it that I'm seeking to be a part of and to build? Whose will is it that I'm seeking to know and obey? Now we move into, all right, we got our minds right. We're cleansed, right? We're thinking clearly now. Now we go into our provision. Number four, we are to ask for our daily needs to be met. Like you're supposed to do this. We are to ask for our daily needs needs to be met now for a lot of us we're just like well i always I, I just always i have plenty of groceries i always have the stuff that i need and this really isn't doesn't pertain to me you know what's happening i understand we live in a society that's totally different than the society jesus is speaking to the context but what's happening with your life and possibly with my life is this i'm taking for granted that those things will always be that way i'm taking for granted that i'll always have enough food in my pantry that I'll have substance for multiple days and multiple weeks ahead. I'm, I'm taking for granted that my health is always going to be good. 
I'm taking, I'm speaking for y'all, by the way, not just for myself. I'm taking for granted that my marriage is always going to be in order. I'm taking for granted that my kids will always walk the straight and the narrow. I'm taking for granted that, that things will continue to be the way that they are. I'm taking for granted that my house will never get hit by a tornado. I'm taking for granted that... Our prayerlessness declares our dependence upon ourselves. Think, I'm just think about it for a minute because some of you are like, no, you can't be accusing me this morning. I'm not accusing you. I'm just saying our prayerlessness speaks to the fact that we are very self-dependent and not dependent upon God. Think about that, mull over it. That could be something for the rest of the week, and you'll come back next Sunday and say, you're wrong. You'll be wrong if you say that, but I'm just saying. It's, it's just like, I want you to think through that for a moment. I think in my own life at times when I'm just like, am I grateful? What, what is your daily, in, in, your, in your time of daily prayer, and I mean throughout the day, it says prayer without ceasing. That means all day long is to be in what? Communion with God. That's what that's saying. Pray without ceasing. It's good to have set aside times and get into a quiet space. Doesn't mean you have to be in a room, just a quiet space. Your house may not be quiet, period, especially if you have young kids that might be out in your car, you know, and you're out there putting on white noise and the car's running, right? <laughs> you know, I don't know what your space is, but it's good to have time set aside specifically to have meetings with God. And I'll ask you another question. When you have a meeting that's important with someone, you show up late or you show up on time? I'm talking about human beings. You show up on time, and on time usually means 10 minutes early. How easy it is for us to have a meeting with God that we forfeit on a daily basis for trivial things. Far more important than any person you'll ever talk to, and he is a person. He is our Father in heaven, and yet we so many times sidestep those meetings and fill it with whatever we fill it with. The key here is what? Daily. Daily asking. And daily we're asking for our what? For our daily bread, which is another way of saying, if you're asking in the morning, Lord, provide for me for the rest of the day. If you're asking at night, Lord, provide for me tomorrow's bread. That's what it's saying. Daily bread. Tomorrow's bread. God, I know that you are the provider. What would this bring to the mind of the Israelites or to a Jewish person hearing this prayer, especially then? It'd take them all the way back to Exodus chapter 16 when God sends the manna from heaven. They're over there starving for the most part. They're like, God, I mean... Or Moses, you brought us out here to kill us? What? I mean, you got no provision for us out here? And then God, what? He sends manna supernaturally that they would gather. And what would they do? They would gather it for how many days? One day. Because if they kept it overnight, it would go bad and be sour and have maggots coming off of it. But yet on the sixth day, he would say, gather a double portion and I will make it last. So that you may have a day of what? Rest. Ceasing. Remember, God is not trying to hinder you from making a living. God is trying to remind you that you're a human being, not a human doing. You will die. I will die. Work is good, but work is a horrible God to serve. And I have difficulties with that sometimes, just to stay busy, I think. But work is a horrible God to serve. Serve the one true God and therefore then put work in its proper place and do a really good job. Really good job. Nothing less than your best. But do not neglect your time with God. Don't do it. Don't neglect it. Because God wants to spend time with you. Helmut Thielich, I think is how you pronounce his name, said this in such a good quote. Great things, small things, spiritual things, and material things, and inward things, and outward things... There is nothing that is not included in this prayer. There's nothing. Ask. Ask. Well, I don't want to bother God. You are bothering God by your inactivity in asking. <laughs> like, it's more bothersome that we as his children don't come to him. Can he not provide for our needs? Now, we've got to distinguish between our wants and our needs. we also got to get ourselves in order. I will obey you, God, even when it's hard, even when it hurts, even when I've got to make some big course corrections in my life. 
I will obey you, God. It's your kingdom. It's you whom I seek. We are God's children, and we're to come to him as children. You ever have a small child come to you and ask you for something? Before they get really calculated. You know what I'm talking about. You know when a kid's getting really calculated. But I'm talking about before they get really calculated, they just bust into your room. Dad, I want this. I want this and this and this and this. <laughs> Beckham right now, he, uh, <laughs> every single thing he sees, if it's an 18-wheeler on the road, I want that truck, Dad. He, he sees a trailer, I want that trailer, Dad. He sees a tractor, I want that trailer, or that tractor, Dad. I want that truck, Dad. I want this, I want that gun, Dad. And he'll name off everything under the sun. Now, is that how we should approach God? No, but at the same time, like, why do you never ask? Well, I'm going to work hard for it. Yeah, sure. Ask, and in the process, work towards it. It's kind of like having a refrigerator full of food, and you're begging God for provision while you're on the couch. Get up. <laughs> Walk over to the refrigerator. Get the food. So there's, there's a part we play, obviously, but it's asking God. Look what it says in the, in the verse I have, and this is chapter 7. We're going to get there weeks to come. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Look at this. This is so good. And this is the confidence that we have towards him, towards our Father, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, and if we know that he hears us and whatever we ask, we know that we will have the request that we ask of him. If we're what? If we're asking according to his, his will. And what does it say? We read it just a moment ago, Romans 12, 1 and 2. We are to discern what the will of God is in some cases. And so don't stop praying about stuff. Like, keep on. And here's the amazing thing that I found over time while praying about things is that whether it's one month, three months, three years, I don't know. But like God refines your understanding and gives you light enough for the next step ahead. And so your prayer where it started, God will begin to change your heart to align you with his will and his desire for you or for the person you're praying for. And you begin to be in line exactly where God would have you to be and I think that's such an important thing to remember but this leads me to the next now we can talk about forgiveness number five we are to forgive others debts before we ask for forgiveness from our father forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our what our debtors this is included in the what in the daily daily asking for provision daily asking for forgiveness daily asking that God do what Protect us from being tempted and deliver us from the evil one daily. Not just a Sunday thing. Not just a when I'm in trouble. Daily. Now notice the word here, debt. Debt's speaking about sin. It's not talking about physical money here, of course. And we get an example of this very thing being displayed in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23 through 35. When he talks about there was two debtors, one who owed 10,000 talents and then one who owed a much smaller amount. He forgave the one who could never pay him back. The king did. But then when that person got set free, he held the other person, grabbed him by the throat and said, you're going to be in prison until you give me my money. And it wasn't hardly anything. He says the king found out about it and did what? Said you, because you would not show kindness, forgiveness, will now be thrown in until every single cent is paid. See, now, this is the only one out of all of these that actually gives us a little bit of a commentary. Look at verses 14 and 15, if you have your Bible open. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. There's a reciprocal thing going on here. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you. So what does this mean? What does it mean? What well, means exactly what it says it means. God, who is perfect and holy, forgave you. Who are imperfect and unholy, he's never done you wrong, and we've rebelled and do it on a regular basis. 
if he can forgive us, how is it that we can maintain unforgiveness towards fellow sinners? This really gets down to the core, and again, we'll talk about it in a couple weeks, but to the core of the, your understanding of the gospel. Understanding what God has done for you. Understanding of how great you've been forgiven, which then leads you to a place where then you therefore forgive others. Does that mean it's going to be easy? No. No, no, no. Does it mean it's going to happen overnight? No. Does it mean you might be seeking to forgive the person on a continual basis for a very long period of time? Yes. Does it mean you're going to forget? No. And everybody's like, I just want the easy stuff. The real is never easy. And Christianity is real. For we follow a true and real Savior. Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Ready? Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Which leads me to my last six. We are to ask for God's protection concerning temptations and deliverance from the evil one. We're to ask for protection concerning temptation. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. After we ask to be forgiven of our sins, past, we ask the Lord to protect us from future sin. Y'all following that? Lord... Forgive me of what I have done. I'll tell you a a bad place to be. If you never think you have anything to be forgiven of, that's callous. That's hardness of heart. So we're not only to pray that Lord forgive us as we have already forgiven our debtors, but Lord protect us from sinning against you. Now, when you read this, though, this gets really confusing. And I would have an assumption that some of y'all would even be asking the question. So is God trying to lead us into temptation? I thought, like, I thought he didn't want us to be tempted. I mean, what, what is this? And so, again, the word that's here in the Greek can either be tested or tempted. It can be used interchangeably in Scripture depending on the context, depending on the persona behind this. So is God really trying to tempt us to sin? I thought that was Satan's job. I thought that's what he did. And the answer is God tempts no one. we got to differentiate between what is temptation and what is testing or trial. Temptation is causing you to forsake God, to abandon God, to sin against God, to rebel against God, lawlessness. That's what temptation is seeking to lead you to. Temptation in and of itself is not sin, but giving in to temptation or falling into temptation, that is sin. You and I are tempted every day. That does not mean you give in to temptation at every single turn. By God's grace, we do not. Amen? But there's a difference between being what? Tested. And a difference between having a trial. A trial is intended to expose what's in your heart, to encourage you, to exhort you, to cause you to be more dependent upon God for your needs. Like a trial or a test. Think about this. At school, you take a test for what reason? Well, have you learned the material or the curriculum that we've led up to this point, and are you ready to move on? Like, that's the whole point of it. And God, as a good father, does what? Our Hebrews chapter 12. He disciplines those whom he loves so that, you ready for it, you can share in his holiness. God is not the bad mother or father, right? He's not the bad parent that spanks the child out of sheer pleasure. Not at all. God's desire for you is to grow up into the conformity of Jesus Christ, his son, that you would be holy, that you would be a person of integrity, that you would love justice, that you would show mercy, that you would walk humbly before your God, right? God is working in and through your life. And some of you are like, well, I'd like this test to be over. Keep praying. Keep seeking God. But you said in verse 8, he already knows what I need. It's a relationship. He loves you. He wants to hear from you. Man, this is, I'm telling you. See what I mean? I messed up. But at least we're covering kind of a big, and then we're going to kind of break it down from week to week. 
In James 1, 13 through 15, it says this, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. But a few verses back in James 1 as well, it says this, Count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Remember Abraham? Genesis 22. Abraham, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him on the mountain that I show you. And Abraham... Got up early the next morning, took three people with him and took his son Isaac and trusted that God would provide. He was obedient, he was faithful to the call of God, and of course God said what? No, Abraham, I will provide. You know who he provided, right? Jesus. He provided himself. He provided his son. The perfect sacrifice for imperfect people. And some of you say, well, that he tested, yeah, he tested Abraham, but Jesus too. Just go two chapters back. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Jesus has taken what? Verse 1. The Holy Spirit sent him into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. There is nothing, doesn't make it any easier, doesn't make you feel any better, isn't going to change your circumstance when you walk out of this building in just a few minutes. But there is nothing as a follower of Jesus Christ that you go through in this life that God is not going to use for your betterment in the eternal sphere of things, okay? God works out what? Romans 8, 28. All things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God works out. Now, that work may take a lifetime, but he is fully committed to making you just like his son, Jesus. Fully committed in my life to making me like his son. The more dependent upon him that we are and the more we draw near to him, the more that takes place. As Trent comes up, I'll read this last verse as we prepare our hearts to take of the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13, it says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed, lest he fall. No temptation has ever overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. The Lord's Prayer, when you get into the details, it takes a lifetime to pray. And so I look forward to the next couple of weeks diving in together and really just saying, God, reveal who you are. Let us see your kingdom clear list. Let us be obedient to your will. Be aware of these things. Let us be a praying people for our needs and for the needs of others. Let us be a forgiving people and let us... Let us not be led into temptation. Lord, protect us from ourselves. Draw us near to you. Let's stand together as we pray. Lord, we thank you for this time of taking the Lord's Supper. We thank you for the intimacy that it invites us to. This is a looking forward to the banquet that you will throw for all of your people one day in the new heaven and new earth, Lord God. I'll draw our hearts near. May we never take for granted the salvation that we have, the relationship that we have, and the fact that you surround us with fellow believers who are walking this journey together. Thank you for this time of taking the Lord's Supper. May we take this in a manner which is worthy of your name. In Jesus we pray.